Welcome back to our news bulletin. We start with Pakistan Army, which says unprovoked Indian firing has wounded 10 civilians, including two children and two women in Jan Rote and Nikiel sectors along the line of control. In a statement, the military's media wing said the Pakistan Army responded effectively to Indian aggression, killing one soldier and wounding three. It said the Indian troops deliberately targeted civilians with artillery and mortar fire. The Foreign Office has summoned India's charged DFS to register protest over ceasefire violations along the LOC. The sister of former Chief Minister of Occupied Kashmir, Umar Abdullah, has moved the Indian Supreme Court, challenging his arrest under Public Safety Act. Last week, New Delhi arrested him and former Chief Ministers Mehbooba Mufti under the controversial law. In her petition, Sara Abdullah said that there is no plausible evidence to detain a person who is already under arrest for six months. Earlier, Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir High Court refused to hear a plea against the controversial act. In its short verdict, it said the court is not a proper forum to scrutinize the merits of administrative decision to detain a person. Under the controversial law, the Indian government can keep anyone under arrest for up to two years without trial. The valley is reeling under India-imposed curfew and communications blackout for 190 days. Hundreds of Pakistanis and Kashmiris took to the streets in Vienna and Athens against the Indian clampdown of occupied Kashmir. New Delhi has shut down the valley after revoking its special status on August 5th, sparking a humanitarian crisis. In Vienna, participants assembled near the Austrian parliament and marched towards the Indian embassy. Meanwhile, in Athens, protesters staged a massive demonstration outside the Indian embassy chanting anti-India slogans. The protesters expressed solidarity with Kashmiris and asked the global community to help end Indian atrocities in the valley. Fresh protests against the controversial Citizenship Act have broken out in the Indian capital of New Delhi. The Indian government has been facing countrywide protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act since December 12th. A large number of students and activists held a protest at Jamia Millia University in Delhi and are now marching towards the parliament. In an effort to curb the demonstration, Delhi police stopped, manhandled and baton charged the students. Meanwhile, similar protests are being held in Mumbai, Kolkata, Maharashtra and Lucknow. Meanwhile, Indian Supreme Court has refused to remove protesters from capital New Delhi's Shaheen Bagh, rejecting a plea by BJP. Filed by Nan Kishore, the petition pleaded that the protest is causing agitation and disturbance for citizens. In its verdict, the court issued a notice to the Indian government and Delhi police seeking a reply. The court said there cannot be indefinite protests in a public area, adding what will happen if everybody starts protesting. The case will resume on February 17th. India has been facing countrywide protests against the law for three months in which 27 people were killed. The all-women sit-in against the controversial citizenship law has continued since December 14th last year despite attacks. Moving on, the Taliban say they have discussed the Afghan peace process with Qatar's Foreign Minister Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani. The group spokesperson Sohail Shaheen said the Taliban delegation is headed by Mullah Baradar Akhund and includes Mullah Mohammed Fadl and Mullahvi Amir Khan. The spokesperson said the delegation also met U.S. Special Envoy Zalmi Khalil Saad. He said important issues regarding the outcome of the negotiations and future agenda were discussed during the meeting. Taliban and the U.S. are currently holding a fresh round of talks to end the Afghan war and devise a plan for withdrawal of American forces. In China, the deadly new coronavirus has killed 98 more people in the past 24 hours. The death toll has risen to 909, while the number of people infected also went up a record 3,062. China's National Health Commission says over 40,000 people are now infected with the disease. This report has more. The new coronavirus has broken all previous records of deaths and the number of infections. But Beijing claims the number of newly infected people has somewhat stabilized. China's health officials say the hysteria has been overhyped as more than 3,000 patients have been cured and discharged. 
Some of them have entered a stable phase with all indicators returning to normal and with a good mental state. Some patients are recovering quickly after meticulous treatment and isolation, and some are already expecting to be discharged. The French authorities have closed two schools for this week, as five new coronavirus patients were identified and hospitalized. They have also set up a permanent crisis committee after the number of cases rose in France. La première mesure, c'est... Uh... Crisis cells are going to be permanently set up, first of all in the town halls with the crisis center in the town halls of contaminants, which is going to be set up as of this evening with the possibility of having answers to the questions that people will ask. The World Health Organization has sent a team of experts to Beijing to help investigate and possibly find a cure for the new virus. In a related development, air crew at Bangladesh National Carrier Biman have refused to work on a flight meant to repatriate citizens from virus-hit Chinese cities. The move has forced the government to scrap its evacuation plan. Last week, Bangladesh removed 312 people and planned a second flight for another 171 nationals. The Interior Ministry says no crew member wants to go to China and those who went earlier do not wish to return. It says the government is trying to charter a Chinese flight instead. Egypt's army has killed 10 terrorists in northern Sinai province. In a statement, the armed forces claimed they prevented a militant assault on a security post in the province. The statement said an SUV used by the terrorists was destroyed. The army says an operation to find the remaining gunmen is underway. Egypt has been fighting an insurgency which has killed hundreds since the removal of President Mohamed Morsi in July 2013. The army says most attacks were claimed by a Sinai-based group loyal to ISIS. Seven armed separatists have been killed during an attempted arson attack on a polling station in southwestern Cameroon. The country's military says separatists attacked the town of Bangam during legislative and municipal elections. Other clashes broke out in Mayuka, a rebel stronghold in the northwest. Witnesses say there was also a shooting incident in the town of Bao in the southwest. Officials say water turnout was low despite security arrangements and a heavy military presence. These are the first elections in seven years after being postponed twice. The 33rd African Union Summit has opened in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa on Sunday. On the agenda are Sudan's listing as a state sponsor of terror and security in the Sahel region. More in this report. The African Union comprises 55 states who hold such events on a yearly basis to improve cooperation across the continent. This year's summit was also attended by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who called for a new anti-terrorism coalition in Africa. He also called for Sudan's removal from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. I want to say clearly and loudly here, it is time to expunge Sudan from the list of states supporting and funding terrorism and to drum up international support that will enable the country to overcome its challenges. The summit will also focus on the crisis in Libya. AU chairperson Moussa Faki declared the country's civil war is an African problem in need of an African solution. I want to welcome the decision of the high-level committee on Libya for the speedy launch of the initiative for peace and reconciliation in Libya in harmony with the decisions of the Berlin Conference and in conformity with the principles of African solutions for African problems, far from the external interference which have a perilous agenda for Africa. African leaders also condemned U.S. President Donald Trump's Middle East peace plan. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Ishtaye, who also attended the event, said his countrymen will not accept a deal that doesn't give them any dignity. We learned from Prophet Jesus that it is not with the bread ones live only. Palestinians are not looking for additional loaf of bread. Palestinians are looking for dignity, for freedom, for an independent Palestinian state. Thank you very much. The Union hopes to bring all violent conflicts on the continent to an end in line with Agenda 2063, which is the bloc's master plan to transform Africa into a future economic powerhouse. 
Azerbaijan's ruling party is leading in Sunday's snap parliamentary elections called by President Ilham Aliyev. The president has been in office for the past 17 years. The Central Election Commission says new Azerbaijan's candidates have won 65 of the 125 seats in the single-chamber parliament. Meanwhile, the opposition has rejected the results, accusing the ruling party of widespread ballot stuffing and voter fraud. Eric Gendry of the Republican Alternative Party is the sole opposition politician who made it into the new legislature. Election officials claim the voter turnout stood at nearly 48% with over 5 million people eligible to vote. Russia says it is worried by Kiev's statements on revising the Minsk agreements unless they are implemented soon. In an interview, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said Ukraine wants to control the conflicted Donbass border. Lavrov said the Ukrainian authorities will strangle the local population in Donbass. Speaking about U.S. relations, he said the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty should remain a safety net for Moscow and Washington. The Foreign Minister said the U.S. can rapidly deploy shorter and intermediate range missiles in the Asia-Pacific region. But he said the geographical reality shows a large part of Russia will be exposed to these missiles. Slovenia has endorsed Turkey's bid to join the EU, calling Ankara to European Union strategic partner. Ahead of his visit to Ankara, Slovenia's Deputy Prime Minister Miro Serrar said an open dialogue with Turkey is important. He said, EU Council conclusions confirm Turkey as a candidate country. He said, the current stalemate in the accession process should not be seen as a sign of weakening ties with the bloc. Serrar said, Luzhi Bilia opposes closing the door on Turkish EU ambitions. Slovenia and Turkey signed a strategic partnership accord in March 2011 and aimed to improve economic cooperation. China has asked the French government not to discriminate against Huawei as it selects suppliers for its 5G mobile network. China's Paris embassy says it fears Huawei will face more constraints than its competitors. In a statement, the embassy called for transparent criteria if Paris wants to oppose limits on operators over security fears. It said Beijing does not want to hamper the development of EU companies in China. In Britain, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab said the UK takes US concerns about Huawei seriously, calling it a high-risk vendor. The UK granted Huawei a limited role in its 5G mobile network last month. Google has taken the EU Commission to Europe's second highest court to appeal against a $2.64 billion antitrust fine. The general court based in Luxembourg will hear agreements from Google. The EU Commission will be supported by Germany and eight other companies. In 2017, the EU Antitrust Commission accused Google of monopolistic business practices and imposed a massive fine. It was the biggest levy against a single company in an EU antitrust case. The Commission has decided uh, to fine Google uh, 2.4 billion euros for breaching EU antitrust rules. Google has abused its market dominance as a search engine by giving illegal advantages to another Google product. We have a lot more coming up right after this short break, so stay tuned. Welcome back to a news bulletin. Iran's space program has suffered a setback for with its victory satellite failing to reach Earth orbit. In a tweet, the Iranian communication minister said the satellite launch had not gone as planned. He said the country will make improvements in future launches. The minister said it blasted off from the Imam Khomeini Space Center in Semnan province. Meanwhile, Tehran unveiled a new short-range missile called Riyadh 500 with a range of 200 kilometers. Europe's solar orbiter probe has blasted off on its mission to study the sun from close quarters. The 1.3 billion euro mission is packed with cameras and sensors to reveal new insights into the workings of our star. Researchers hope the knowledge gathered by solar orbiter will improve models used to forecast the worst solar flare outbursts. 
Scientists say they want to better understand what drives the sun's dynamic behavior. Our star occasionally ejects billions of tons of matter that strikes the Earth's magnetic field and could disrupt activity on Earth. The worst of these solar flares can damage satellite electronics, interfere with radio communications and even knock out power grids. In the UK, it has been estimated that most food produced globally ends up in the bin. The waste is causing economic as well as environmental loss. To combat the problem, UK authorities have launched a series of apps that allow users to share their surplus food, otherwise destined to be wasted. More in this report. In just a couple of clicks, Jack has ordered his lunch. But he's also helped to rescue food that would otherwise end up in the rubbish bin. Jack is buying through an app called Karma, which connects users with restaurants and cafes selling their surplus food at discount prices. Anything I can do to help the environment and also look after the budget as well is beneficial. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a win-win. Around 2,000 UK outlets are selling their leftover meals through the Swedish startup. The app allows participating businesses to make some money on food that would otherwise be thrown away. According to resource efficiency charity RAP, food waste costs the British restaurant sector £682 million each year. So why not just make less? So we don't plan for the day to end up with zero waste because at the end of every day we do want to have some stock on our shelves. Otherwise a customer could walk in and see an empty store. But 70% of food waste comes from the home, with the average British family throwing out £800 worth of edible produce every year. Roughly 10% of all of our annual greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste alone, which I like to point out to people is four to five times greater than the carbon emissions that come from the global aviation industry. In 2018, the UK still ranked in the top 10 high income countries with the greatest levels of food loss. And with 10 billion meals a year still ending up in the bin, the UK has yet to fully close the door on the food waste problem. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Oh, really pleasure. appreciate it. Bye bye. In Italy, partygoers have come out in style for the annual Venice Carnival months after the city was hit by its worst floods since 1966. The festival opened with a variety of boats and floats swimming in the city's canals, attracting tourists from around the globe. Watch more about the celebrations in this report. Hundreds of revelers in Venice lined up the narrow alleys to admire a flotilla of boats carrying spectacularly dressed participants. Some dressed like animals and prisoners, while others camouflaged as cartoon characters. The annual Venice Carnival is popular for its elaborate masks and costumes. I really like the Venice Carnival. I come here every year with a different mask. I always have a lot of fun. There is a nice and fun atmosphere, full of masks, beautiful costumes. I like it a lot. I never miss it. The festival is said to date back to the 11th century. It marks a period of opulence before the beginning of Lent, the season when Christians begin 40 days of fasting in the run-up to Easter. It is always a great experience. It is a meeting of peoples and makes us forget about everyday life. This is the best thing. It's the first time that I take part in the Venice Carnival. It is a beautiful experience. This year's carnival will end on February 25th. At the 92nd Academy Awards in Los Angeles, South Korean film Parasite finally climbed Mount Oscar. The movie became the first foreign language film to win the Best Picture and Best International Feature Film. This report has details. Hollywood's awards season comes to a close with a star-studded evening at last night's Oscars. Nominees and guests showed off their glitzy outfits posing for photographers. While a lavish stage featuring 40,000 crystals at Los Angeles' Dolby Theatre glittered, as 24 golden statues were handed out on Tinseltown's biggest night. And the Oscar goes to Parasite. <laughs> South Korean social satire Parasite broke barriers, winning in four major categories, including Best Picture of the Year. Uh, thank you. Uh, great, Anna. The category has a new name now from the Best Foreign Language to Best International Feature Film. 
I am so happy to be its first recipient under the new name. And the Oscar goes to Joaquin Phoenix Joker. The four acting wins followed the script. Joaquin Phoenix took Best Actor for Joker, while Renee Zellweger won the Best Actress for her role in Judy. And the Oscar goes to Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt won his first Oscar in acting for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, sharing the category for supporting actor with Laura Dern in Marriage Story. This really is about Quentin Jerome Tarantino. You are original, you are one of a kind. Uh, uh, the, the film industry would be a much drier place without you. And I, and I love the ethos you gave Cliff Booth. The Oscar goes to Renee Zellweger. Eight of the nine nominated Best Pictures have earned at least one award with 1917 winning Oscar for visual effects. Once Upon a Time garnered one for production design, while Ford vs Ferrari won the sound and editing prizes. The glamorous night contrasted with the grief over the recent deaths of Golden Age film legend Kirk Douglas and Oscar-winning basketball star Kobe Bryant. Stock markets across Europe are trading lower with ongoing concerns about the coronavirus outbreak in China. Investors are short-selling major stocks as they watch the economic losses incurred by the disease. Frankfurt's DAX and the Paris CAC 40 are each trading over half a percent lower. London's FTSE 100 is trading fractionally lower as widespread and Centrica shares fall by over 2%. In Asia, Nikkei 225 led the losses, closing over 0.6% lower. The Shanghai Composite recovered early losses, closing half a percent higher as China's central bank offered $43 billion to help businesses. In commodities, international Brent crude oil prices have lost three quarters of a percent on diminishing global demand. Hundreds of flights and train services have been cancelled across northwest Europe by the arrival of Storm Sierra. Strong winds battered Britain and Ireland, where tens of thousands of homes were left without power. Swedes of northern France have been placed on orange alert, with people advised to avoid the coast. Britain remained vigilant, with the Met Office warnings of strong winds, heavy rain and snow. The highest recorded wind speed was 150 km per hour in the northwest Wales village of Aberdeen. The West Yorkshire towns of Hebden, Bridge and Mytle of Mord were worst hit with streets inundated and cars submerged in flood water. Sports events were also hit as football and rugby matches were cancelled and a London road race was called off. The, now let's look at the weather from around the globe. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.